At COP28 in Dubai, the world has witnessed historical pledges. So 22 nations vowed to triple nuclear capacity by 2050, going from approximately 400 gigawatts to 1200 gigawatts. And about 123 countries pledged to triple their renewable capacity from 3600 gigawatts up to 11,000 gigawatts. Now on the surface, this sounds really ambitious and promising, but during this video, I'm going to show you why this is not even remotely enough. Now, to make sure that this video is not going to take an hour of your time, I'm going to boil things down to the essence. 6.7 billion people in the non-OECD, they use about 15.6 megawatt hours per person per year in primary energy. Now, contrast that with 1.4 billion people in the OECD who use 47.1 megawatt hours per person per year in primary energy. There you can already see a big disparity. Now, when we plot the difference in a chart like you can see right here, you can see how inequitable the balance between the OECD and the non-OECD really is. So this should also give us pause because we have to ask ourselves, who are we kidding with these pledges? I I'm a little bit jaded about this because yes, these pledges are great news. They finally show some commitment. They finally, uh, show that nuclear is also an acceptable part of the solution. But it should give you pause because this is COP28. There have been 27 COPs before this, and we're still not even landing really strong punches against this whole climate change problem that we have. So the difference between a non-OECD and the OECD is huge. And we can bet that the people who are living in a non-OECD world that they either are going to migrate to the OECD world, which is what you see right now, or th those who still live in the non-OECD countries, they are going to try to catch up with us. And this is logical because everybody deserves to live a better, more prosperous and more healthy life. I even think that this is a basic human right. So how big is this energy challenge of ours going to be when they really catch up with us? The, so the first thing that I'm going to assume is that 50% of all the non-electric related primary energy that we use today is going to be electrified by 2050. And the second assumption that I'm going to make is that all the fossil fuels that we use today for heating, for fueling cars and vehicles, and to do certain kinds of chemistry, uh, we need to synthesize somehow. So this basically shifts the burden from uh, basically extracting the oil, the coal or the gas from, from the ground to having a uh, technology somewhere that produces an X amount of heat, which then can be used to create these molecules, which we then use in whatever process that we need them. So that's still a sizable problem. So the paradigm shift will be this, because the electricity production per capita uh, is going to rise up to 8.98 megawatt hours per person per year. And the thermal energy that needs to be produced each year for the molecules, for the heat, etc., that's going to be 6.86 megawatt hours per person per year. Now, before we go on, I first must tell you that this 11,000 gigawatt pledge is not for 2050, but actually for 2030. So when we take a linear growth rate from 2022 until 2030, and then project on until 2050, then we get to build approximately 30,000 gigawatts of renewables. And there's also another thing that we need to consider, because if we want to suck CO2 from the air, which some people think that we need to do, and at a rate of 10 gigatons per year by 2050, that will cost us about 15,000 terawatt hours per year in thermal energy. And you need another 3,600 terawatt hours per year for the electrical energy that you need. So let's add the carbon capture energy that is required to the balance. And this brings the need for uh, annual electricity production up to 93,400 terawatt hours per year. And the thermal needs will rise up to 83,300 terawatt hours per year. So that's for all electricity and all thermal, including the direct air capture of carbon dioxide. 
So how far do we get with these pledges and the assumptions that are made about our collective energy use by 2050? So barring reliability and getting electricity whenever you need it, because that's still a big question mark, uh, the pledges plus the assumed growth almost seem to do the trick but that's just in terms of electricity. We fall completely and utterly short of the thermal needs for heating and chemistry. And that's the real problem because electrification can take you only so far. And that is the real lesson of today because yes, it does look promising for electricity uh, if you consider all the pledges and it's very optimistic, uh, but for all our energy needs, when you look at it critically, then I think that they are really insufficient. They are not going to cut it. And remember that one of the assumptions that I made was that I cut 50% of the non-electrical energy demand and I basically electrified it using the force somehow. And that gives us a huge efficiency gain. So from 20% end use efficiency, we go up to like 90 or 95% end use efficiency. Now in the next video, I'm going to highlight a technology which I think uh, is still underutilized. Actually, it isn't being used at all. Uh, most of these things are still in the development phase. And I think that once we get started with building those we might actually see a true paradigm shift no 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 shoo it, it's not your time yet next video next video and that's it you've again reached the end of the next video um if you're still here that's amazing because view time is the lifeblood of this channel on youtube now unfortunately my car is leaking engine oil and the timing chain needs to be replaced and this is something i can't fix myself so if you want to help me pay for the repairs, please check in the description below how you can help. Now, in the top of the screen, you see people who have donated to the channel. I'm immensely, immensely thankful for that. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas and may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye.